Shazam. Got it. All right. Shazam. I said it. Nothing happened, but I said it. Oh, so something's supposed to happen? I yeah. think you're you're thinking of Kazam. Mm. Oh, that's right. Not to be confused yes. with the 1990s genie movie starring Shaquille O'Neal. That's what I was. <laughs> that is the that is the real one. You're thinking right. of your Mandela effect is is reality. You're you're misremembering reality, whereas everybody else misremembers the Sinbad version, which is not real. Wait, it wasn't True. real. That never happened. No. Oh, wow. Man of the Heck. House. Or first kid, first kid mm, mm. did happen. Yeah, yeah, it was in that era. Yeah. Right. Right. Hmm. That's still too hot for me to drink. Hmm. I, uh, I, I, if you have a lid on like, like maybe like a Starbucks lid, and I haven't drank from it yet, and you watch me have that first sip, mm-hmm. it is. I don't know if it's as nerve wracking for you as it is for me when I'm trying to have that first sip, but I get like so scared that it's going to burn me that it's like, it takes, it takes me a good, good while for me to get that first, that first sip in there. Mm. After that, I'm good, but I'm always scared. Why is the lid? Cause it's deceptive. Cause I can't see when it's coming. I can't see where it's like, Oh, is it going to get, it, it it. get there? Got it. Don't live in fear. If you can't chug your coffee, I mean, I don't know. Are we even friends? Uh, it's not even coffee. Coffee, coffee's the deciding factor here. Look, we've we've it's all a got very large uh, part. It's a very large part of my life. Yes. <laughs> I've gotten more into coffee lately, but usually it's ninety percent milk and sugar. So that's one of my. That's this is going to sound terrible, but that's one of the that's one of the things I enjoy about. Uh, Good Friday, Holy Friday, <clears throat> because it's particularly an a liturgical day. We're not allowed to sell. You know, there's no liturgy. I we have the celebration coffee. of the hours in the morning, and so I can get I can drink a cup of coffee, and then go to church and and celebrate a service, and that doesn't happen other times. <laughs> Just picture Father Bunny. You have to be like mm, saddest day of the year. <laughs> It's joyful sorrow. It's black coffee. <laughs> there's no cream. There's no sugar. It's just black coffee. It's bitter. It's a bitter. It's, I drink a dark roast. No, no, I would. I would drink it for the sure. The sure. Like this is bitter. I, I probably. I should take. I should drink this because I don't like it. It's joyful sorrow in a mug for crying yeah, out loud. Yeah. Hmm. I think that's a great way to describe black coffee. Joyful sorrow. Yeah. No, just sorrow for me. Maybe if there's a uh, a monastic roaster out there, we can have them add it to their tasting notes for their signature blend. I have a roaster in my parish. I'll ask him. <laughs> Joyful sorrow. <laughs> Ooh, the the, the harmolipi really comes through. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, there's still steam. banter. <laughs> you just say banter now we, were, yeah. we, res- we resorted to just saying banter oh banter name it and claim it how have your week's been i can't believe it's wednesday well I had it, it's we're not, we would not be here true why can't you believe it's Wednesday? What what makes this is this is time flying by? Time is flying by. It's good because it's cold and I don't like these months. Oh my gosh, it's so cold. Yeah. What about you? Woke up today, the thermostat said outside was negative 18. Sounds about right. With the wind chill? No, that was just like I got up at I got up the this is my life. I got up in order to turn on the heater in the garage to warm up the garage and have mm. my morning coffee. So like 530 in the morning before the sun came up, it was negative 18. Oh. Yeah. Wow. I don't like any yeah. of that sentence. No, nothing. Nothing. Let's get us through Five, February. 530 a.m. You don't like. 
<laughs> morning coffee. No part of that like, sentence. Yeah, except yeah. for morning coffee. Garage. <laughs> you live in Astoria. What is that? <laughs> That's right. We, we park on the street here. Thank you very much. Right. Oof. I have uh, my, my garage is uh, is just a total mess during the summer. During the summer months, you like just toys and everything gets mm-hmm. just fills it. And so we park in the, in the driveway. But like end of October, I'm like scrambling to clean my garage so that I can get our cars in there. So I don't have to do the street parking in this weather type of thing. I don't want to walk out of my house to get into my car first thing in the morning. I haven't parked my car in a garage since I was in high school. Wow. Which is hilarious because I am the only male child in a Greek family. So, of course, I had a garage spot and my sisters didn't. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Especially your, your youngest, your younger sister. She didn't get it. Actually, for, for well, she wasn't either, driving like by the, the time. Older? By the time I left, yeah, my older sister, yeah, no, and yeah, it was my parents and me in the garage. Wow. Even my yaya was out on the in the in the. What? That's ridiculous. That's, she didn't drive that's, that much. That's on you. That's on she you. She didn't drive that much. <laughs> I'm to look into Hellenic family dynamics right now. <laughs> wow. I'm the only I was the only boy. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it was. Tag privilege. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, should we get into things? <laughs> yes. How do you like my, how do you like my sweater vest? I thoroughly best? annoyed you with my... I have a sweater vest on ask? today. I have a sweater mm-hmm. vest on today. You know what I've never understood? Hmm. The mock. The mock turtleneck. The, the one that doesn't flip? Yeah. What, what, I find what it do insulting. You what, what do you understand about the turtleneck? But, but you, you know, now that I've said that, about... now that I've said that, it makes more sense than the full turtleneck. What about it? Why? What? What about it makes sense or doesn't make sense? It's a shirt. I just, I know, but it's just like, who, like, oh, this inch of my neck is, could use a little extra warmth. I don't know. Well, that's no cold air is getting in. Like so, I mean, it's kind of what seals, doing. it like seals everything. Do you have a, is that a constant problem you have to worry about a downdraft? Um, well, you know, <laughs> if you're like, if that's what a scarf's for, it's like a built-in scarf. Yeah, I guess. So you can never remove. Yeah. Well, you can't at the end of the day. Once you go home. What if somebody invented a turtleneck with some Velcro on the bottom? Such that you could like a removable, yeah, like a neck brace, except a turtleneck. That sounds Wait. like something you should try. Uh, try making like that's like a, like a in your video, like a dicky. Higher, yeah. A higher, a, a turtleneck dicky. Yeah, exactly. You heard the it here. Not. You can't. You can't go straight over because you can. You mess up your hair. That's true. So it needs to be right. Okay. It's got to be like a little discreet zip in the back. Right. If I quit this podcast on account of incredible wealth, this is why. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. You got to find All some right. partners to go into development with you on your <laughs> removable <laughs> turtleneck. Look for the infomercial at 2 a.m. Do you hate turtlenecks? <laughs> There's got to be a better way. <laughs> it's all black and white. And then it turns, turns color. All right. For the third time. Let's try this. <laughs> I think I think probably Nick wants to start. Although we just got him to some good banter finally. Uh oh, did yeah. I go away? Without I? without even having to say banter. I know. <laughs> right. uh, banter. That see that laugh. laugh accompanies a turtleneck very well. Yes. Does it accompany a sweater vest? It could. It could. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, father. <laughs> Bless. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Shine within our hearts, loving Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open our eyes to understand the teachings of your gospel. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual way of life, both thinking and doing those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ, our God, of the light of our souls and bodies, and to you we send up glory, together with your beginningless Father, your all holy good and life creating spirit, now and forever into the age of ages. Amen. Amen. Thanks for not stealing my MN this time. Sure. I just had a conversation 
with our catechumens last night about saying amen to your own prayer. Made me think of made me think of both of you. Oh, thanks. Shocks. So we are uh, celebrating on the new calendar this Sunday, the Feast of the Three Hierarchs. So the epistle reading that we'll be offering and reflecting on today is associated with the Feast of the Three Hierarchs. It's not part of the regular Sunday um, apostolic cycle. <clears throat> and it comes from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. It begins, brethren, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the, the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is well that the heart be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited their adherence. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city which is to come. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that, acknowledges, that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Amen. So we, we've done an intro to Hebrews. I think we did one relatively recently. Sure. Let's just assume we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody knows we don't need to spend any time. <laughs> no background, no context. I mean, I don't know. Do we want no, to? No, no, no. You... We, we don't need to. Oh, okay. We're, no, okay. we're, good. we're actually sidestepping. Yeah. We will. There'll be one. There'll be one point that I have to make later that like brings in the, the broader context, but. I don't think so. Okay. Um, but this reading, uh, aside from being reserved for the three hierarchs, is also the reading that's designated for any celebration of multiple hierarchs um, on a given synaxis or feast day. So if you're celebrating multiple hierarchs together, not just there are two or three hierarchs that are celebrated on the same day, but a specific feast commemorating multiple hierarchs, this is the reading that's used. Example would be um, earlier in the month of January, uh, the feast day of Saints Athanasios and Cyril of Alexandria, the same epistle is read. Um, so it is a general epistle in that sense for the synaxis of multiple hierarchs. There's a separate epistle that's read for a one particular hierarch by himself, but this is the, the reading for multiple. Right. Do we do we want to even talk a little bit about the history of the feast just to give a little bit like of context or sure? Um, it's just I mean it's a story people might know, but just in mm -hmm. you know, in terms of setting the stage, um, I can't remember what century it was offhand now. Ninth, tenth, uh, eleventh, end of the eleventh. Alexios Cominos was the emperor at the time. There was that um, sort of amongst amongst the people. Uh, there were, you know, kind of different uh, different factions that had their particular, sort of particularly favored hierarch in church history. And there's this weird sort of like silly competition: who is the greatest, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then the hierarchs, you know, came to somebody in a dream, right, and said, "Just like celebrate us all on the same day. This is kind of mm -hmm. silly. Don't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Just celebrate us all together. This is yeah. far more in keeping with the mind of Christ." And so yeah. that that's why these these three these three hierarchs are to this day celebrated together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. You know, it was a little bit more, a little bit more rambunctious than just like, oh, I like, I like this one better. You know, everybody has personal relationships with saints that particularly speak to them that they have, as we've talked about before, right? The communion of the saints and our actual cultivated relationship with them is, is a sign of the unity between um, all members of the body of Christ in his, in his kingdom, right? So we understand that you can have a good, strong personal relationship with a particular saint. Um, but I mean, it was, it was getting to the point of like open conflict between, between parties, uh, with Constantinople was a rambunctious city. It was, and it was full of factions, right? They lost the chariots, so they couldn't, they couldn't ride about the chariots. So, you know, they had to ride about bishops. It's, it's true. It's like the, the like 21st and 20th century, like soccer hooligans, right. In the UK yeah. are kind of like ecclesial factions in 11th century Constantinople. Totally. I think it's a perfect, that's a perfect, uh. 
analogy. Um, yeah, and so when they appeared, they appeared to a, a bishop. He, I cannot remember the name of his see, but it's somewhere actually removed from the city. Um, it's not in Constantinople itself. It's further, um, it's further into Pontus. No, it's not. Actually, it's actually not outside. The, I mean, it is outside the city gates, but it's like hundreds of miles outside the city gates. <laughs> okay. Insofar as everything outside. Yes. Right. Right. Insofar as right. we are outside the city gates. Right. Okay. Right. Just, just saying. Just saying. Um, but the reason Perfect. that the it's interesting, <laughs> is, uh, just a little side part. If you look at the Synaxarion, when the three hierarchs appear um, to Bishop, uh, this Bishop John, he they tell him essentially put all of our feasts together so that everybody will see the unity within the kingdom. Uh and but they pretty much told him like when you feel it's appropriate like when there's you know whenever you want right it's not this this doesn't actually commemorate that specific it's not like it appear they appeared to him on the 30th they kind of they gave him the option of when to when to celebrate this uh this feast day and he actually chose we really don't know when on the calendar this happened you know this particular vision but he chose January for their feast day because each of the three have a feast individually in January. And so it would be a way to further commemorate them and to, you know, further show the unity that like we can, we can offer praise and glory to Christ through St. John Chrysostom, through St. Gregor, the theologian, through St. Basil individually and also collectively as, as a part of what we now call this Feast of the Three Hierarchs. So it's in January specifically because of the other three feasts that take place in January. St. Basil on that. January 1st, St. Gregory the Theologian on January 25th, and the trans translation of the relics of St. John Chrysostom on January 27th. I dig. Mm -hmm. Which was yesterday and tomorrow, right? It is the 26th, yeah. yeah. Right in between them. Mm -hmm. Except for basil. Yeah. Outlier. Although, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but around around here, church organizations cut Vasi Lopitas all the way through the <laughs> through the end of the month. Like there's still, I'm still getting invitations to Vasi Lopitas. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's a seasonal. It's the post Christmas. It's just, yeah, season it's, it's yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway. Right on. But the, the tie-in between this particular passage and the feast is the opening, obviously. Yeah. Brethren, remember, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. All right. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a call to, um, again, imitate the hierarchs, those, uh, those teachers. Right? We've, I don't know if we've spoken about, but one of the ancient, you know, if we look at the, the role of the different orders within uh, within the clergy, the primary role originally of the bishop was as teacher, right? It's, it's the Holy Spirit has led to an a increase or a diversification of responsibilities, but originally the, the hierarch was the responsible for the education of, of their people, which is why you see things like um, the catechetical, catechetical homilies of St. Cyril. Like the bishop was the one who was catechizing all of the new um, newly baptized people after their their baptism in Pascha. Yeah. Um, Isn't that well, why Bishop is consecrated prior to the gospel? Yes. In the in the liturgy? Mm -hmm. Right. Because then he's he would, he would teach various changes for yeah. the orders. Yeah. And 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 it might also be worth worth um, saying too, as like a historical footnote, that might be a little bit weird to us because certainly in the United States, a lot of Orthodox Christians can go years and years and years without having any sort of Episcopal interaction. Um, whereas it was far more normative throughout church history for a smattering of bishops to be all over the place. I mean, even of the three that we're celebrating today, right? Like St. John Chrysostom and St. Gregory the Theologian were patriarchs of Constantinople, but um, St. Basil was the Bishop of Caesarea, which wasn't a particularly like major place, but there were there were bishops all, you know, there, there are bishops all over the place is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, even still, even still now um, in, in uh, countries where orthodoxy has, you know, typically been, has been established. Um, it, the number of hierarchs is, is much greater because you have smaller 
Episcopal areas, right? The fact diocese, that, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, whatever, so, so whatever. That, it is. That, that, the that the point being sense. that the bishop is not a is has become an administrator in many ways. Um, he is the overseer. Episcopos means overseer, right? But it it uh, primarily scripturally in the early church that uh, that role was much less administrative much yeah, more so, liturgical and catechetical yeah. so the um who are the leaders that saint paul is talking about here is he talking about specific leaders or does he have certain leaders in mind he then says consider the outcome of their lives and most of the leaders i think a lot of the leaders were martyred yeah prior you know and the outcome of their lives can can I guess dictate how, how depending on how you look at that um could be kind of uh not attractive well i think that goes to that goes to what i was going to say when i mentioned like the broader context of of hebrews the community that's receiving this this letter is uh the community that's going through persecution right mm-hmm. so as we look at the context of the letter and and the time when it was written and to the people who it was sent to it it reveals throughout the course of the letter that the people who are receiving this and are reading this are going through a period of persecution. Mm-hmm. So father, to bring up your, your point, exactly. Right. This mm-hmm. is something that they would understand when they read, remember your leaders, those to you who spoke the word of God and consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. That is, that is a call to uh, strength during persecution. And we see that, and that's really what I think is at play at the end or kind of the, the bottom third of this epistle where um, St. Paul is talking here about the, the sacrifices. And he spends a lot of time in Hebrews talking about temple sacrifice and talking about Christ as the fulfillment of them and the new um, high priesthood and the difference between him and the high priest before I don't think that's exactly what's happening here. When you take what you brought up at the beginning of this passage and the broader context, I think it seems very clear that he's using the themes that he's used before to speak to them about how to face and endure martyrdom Hmm. because his reflections on the, on the uh, sacrifices are not about the consuming of the sacrifices, particularly he, he leads in with that. Right. But he right. talks about, he says, the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin, they're burned outside the camp. So, or likewise, Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. So he's drawing this connection that the blood of those who are, you know, sacrificed saves those who are inside the camp, right? But the sacrifice is made outside of the camp. Hmm. and let us go likewise right right and that's where that's when he gets to therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp and bear the abuses he endured right Right? so it's it's making it's drawing this okay we've talked about early because this is the end of the letter of the hebrews right so he's essentially saying we've talked before about sacrifice earlier i'm going to bring that theme back because it's consistent through all this this entire letter but this passage is really about the example of Christ and the leaders of the church, the hierarchs, suffering for the salvation of those in the camp, i.e. in the church, yeah. and giving them strength to do likewise. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so there's, there's at least, I think, two, two themes that are coming out, even in this preliminary conversation, mm-hmm. right, in terms of, in terms of leadership. Um, one not simply like leadership um, or instruction in an academic sense, which Mm -hmm. is something that we talked about before, right? Like even that first verse, those who spoke the word of God, but he doesn't say, consider their teaching, consider the wisdom of their words, consider their arguments, right? He says, consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. You know, it's a very not, again, abstract notion of what theology is, but it is this thing that is lived and it is thing that has a punchline in this ultimate sacrifice, this martyric sort of witness, right? Not a, to make maybe even kind of draw like a contemporary parable, uh, not a prosperity gospel, not a, not a sort of like 
the Lord guarantees you comfort, right? Um, this well, is not true. abstract theology, and it's and it's and it's lived out in a in a self in a in a suffering sort of way. Yeah, true, but it's it's kind of an and here because he does go on to say, like, watch out for false teachings and stay away from things that like this is you know that and 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 specifically he goes into he goes into a a specific false teaching or he he basically references something to to he references a false teaching by saying the opposite that christ is the same yesterday always and today um which indirectly or maybe directly attacks the the teaching that christ wasn't isn't god or christ wasn't always right so so there's a reason he's he's focusing on on that but um but it's it's a it's a both thing. It's it's uh it's it's now you have you have the teachings that's really important. Don't go away from the false teachings and stick with that and up until the point of death. Just like that, that's how important this is too. It, it's kind of an and thing. It's not necessarily and um as yeah. The point being that the teachings are made. The teachings as authentic teachings are lived in the life of the hierarchs and the leaders of the community and whatnot, right? That there is not a divorce between the words that are spoken, the teachings that are presented and the lived experience of that, right? There's an integrated, there's an, so yes, it's a, it's a both and, but it's, it's almost not even worth, it's almost not even worth making the, the distinction between the two. I think it's, it makes sense to understand their, their teaching as both active and right um it just it's just is yeah right yeah well i think i think it's helpful it's a helpful reminder to us because sometimes um we can over abstract and over philosophize christianity and turn it Mm -hmm. into kind of like things that we read on the page rather than a thing that we do with our lives, right. Which Mm -hmm. manifests in the way that we live, which manifests in the way that we endure patiently. Um, So there, there, there's, there, there are some of those currents out there, which is why I think it's, it's helpful to, you know, like the the three hierarchs are honored and the teachers that St. Paul is talking about are honored, not simply because of their cleverness, right. There is kind of a dogmatic fidelity, but there's also like, they lived as Christians. They died as Christians. Sometimes Mm -hmm. by Christians, at least one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. I <laughs> I mean, with the exception of St. Basil, um, and it's not to say that his life was particularly comfortable or easy, uh, but he, St. Basil struggled firmly against the Arians and, you know, had to battle against, against false teaching. Um, but I mean, St. John Chrysostom was, was marched to his death by the, by Orthodox, you know, proposed Never. Orthodox Christians as well. Right. Um, St. Gregory, the theologian took his ball and went home from, from Constantinople. I love him. His theology is wonderful, but the, his, he, he really did not want to be there. He really did not want to be there. And when he got an opportunity to not be there, oh, he took it. He's kind of my spirit animal. I think about that all the time. <laughs> yeah. But he just in the middle of the council while he's presiding over the second ecumenical council, he's like, you guys are pushing. No, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going to go and just write poetry for the rest of my life. <laughs> right. Homeric poetry, poetry in a dialect that has been not used for a thousand years. Uh, goals, goals. Because it would have been so easy. I'm sorry. I'm just going down this thread. It would have been so easy for him to defend himself because for those who are unfamiliar with the story, he was originally made a bishop by St. Basil. Um, yeah, by St. Saint, by Saint Basil or by his father? Um, no, I think it was by St. Basil. I thought it was Basil, yeah. Yeah, um, of a small sea, small city in, uh, in Cappadocia um, and then was eventually uh, sent to Constantinople to be the Bishop of Constantinople, or at least the Orthodox Bishop. There was maybe, I think there were two, two churches that were Orthodox at the time. The rest had fallen to the Arians. And by the time he was done preaching there, the city had, had been wild, you know, like strongly converted Reclaimed. back to, yeah. to Orthodoxy. Um, but he didn't want to do any of it. And actually when he was first elected Bishop, he, he left, he didn't even go. He didn't even celebrate his first Pascha with his people. I don't think. Or he came back and that was the first time he celebrated. Anyway, um, 
And so at the council, at the Second Ecumenical Council, Eusebius of Nicomedia uh, accused him of violating the canons, which said bishops are not allowed to transfer sees from one see to another because it's like the, uh, the episcopacy is not supposed to be a ladder that you climb for more power, right? You yeah, can't, which, if you were made of a bishop, of a, right? Like that's, if you were made of a yeah. bishop in a, in a small city in, in Cappadocia, that's it. Like you don't get to, you don't use this as a stepping stone for Constantinople. And Gregory pretty much just threw up his hands and was like, all right, fine. You're right. That's in the canons. I'm out. You're right. I'm done. <laughs> Hilarious, hilariously, maybe not. Eusebius did the exact same thing. And that's how he ended up in Nicomedia, which is another very large C. So I mean, like, it would have been very easy to just been like, what about you, dude? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that log in your eye. Excuse yeah. me. <laughs> But yeah. he wanted out. St. Gregory just wanted out. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they maybe they planned it. Hey, will you, will you please call me out on this? Will you just please it's a, just call me out on it and I'll go home? They were bitter enemies. They wouldn't no. Yeah, know. That would not be that would not be how they interacted. No. We're positing a theory of church history as like professional wrestling at this point. That's right. That's right. Then Vince McMahon walks in. Mm-hmm. Is that St. Gregory <laughs> the theologian's <laughs> Um, glass breaking. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. So back to the, the reading here, it, it sounds it, this, when I was reading it, just reading it, it almost seems like he bounces around. Like first he's remember your leaders. And then he's like, and then he just goes into, uh, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be led away. It's like, it's, it's kind of, I don't want to say disjointed, but and 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 there's reason for everything he's saying. Um, but I, I, the the Christ being the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm-hmm. The next sentence is "Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings," which I guess is also probably a kind of a, a point. Then that's another reason why we use this gospel for the three hierarchs. Correct. Um, yes. Uh, but. Then, then, okay, so, so he's talking about the theology a little bit here on who, who Christ is, that he is God, right? It's the O'on, right? The, uh, the one who is. That we have in, yep. And, uh, and then he goes into, um, for it is well that your heart be strengthened by grace, not by foods. Is this just like another way for him to ref like, 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 okay, now we're, we're, we're going to just slowly go back, go into the sacrifice or is he referencing here something more? I think something more, but you got to do some jumps to get there. Okay. Jump away. Jump away. Jump, jump. On belay. Belay on. Um, anyway, <laughs> we're not rock climbing here. Um <laughs> That our hearts be strengthened by grace, not by foods. Does that remind you of anything else? Can you think of a time when you, there's a, a similar uh, statement made in the scriptures? It's not what goes into the mouth that sanctifies somebody. No. Man shall not live by bread alone, yeah, right. but by every right, word right, that right. comes forth. Yeah. Right, right. Right. Yes, yes, yes. right. Which is what Christ says to, to Satan when Satan tempts him. In or attempts to tempt him in the in the desert um, to turn rocks into bread because he's been fasting, right? Right. And Christ responds, "A man shall not live by bread alone, but by okay. uh, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God." Uh, when he says that, he is Christ is in fact quoting quoting uh, from Deuteronomy mm-hmm. as uh, they're receiving the law. And the context of this is about. Um, is about the connection between the manna, the bread from heaven, the heavenly bread that they're receiving, the food that they're receiving, but also the commandments and how um, the delivering of the commandments is uh, kind of verified by the by the the manna, and that the manna is not mm. like normal food. It is food provided by God, and that it is provided because, and in the context of commandments, there's actually commandments about how to eat the manna. And if you don't eat right. the manna, according to the commandments, you don't eat it. 
right? It, it goes bad. Right. It goes bad. Right. You know, Worms, so, stuff. um, so there's this, if you, if you look at, again, you have to kind of make some, you have to build some links in your chain, but if you're understanding that most of this epistle is presented to people who are well-versed in the Hebrew scriptures, it's not, it's not unthinkable to see a connection between that our hearts are strengthened by grace, not by foods. Mankind um, shall live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, not bread, right? Like that, that connection mm-hmm. it thematically is very easy to make. Um, so that right. drives you back to a, a discussion about teachings and commandments and way of mm-hmm. life. Mm. Okay. All right. And then also, it also then is a transition from this teaching. Don't, you know, be be careful of, of, of creatures to the sacrifice of animals and talking about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Because the way that sacrifice is being, is being used here, like we said earlier, isn't merely in the sort of ingestion sense right the sort of right. sacramental sense but rather like the actual offering of oneself in a in a sacrificial way which is the mm-hmm. the conclusion um well, to sort of living faithfully were the hebrews tempted by like worldly things because that's what i initially as like reading this without studying just reading it out you that, mean okay this, the people receiving this letter or like the yeah hebrews, yeah, yeah, yeah hebrews no 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 no, no. The, the the people receiving this letter were they being tempted by the worldly things versus the heaven, the, the more the more spiritual things here, or is he just is he just making this reference and tying it to his you know the the next few sentences? Because as I read it, when I when I when I read or I hear even that you know from um, from Christ's uh, temptation or attempt mm-hmm. at temptation um, is is this how we are as humans in that we it's easy for us to go after the tangible and it's a little more difficult for us to focus on and grow in the spiritual so that's where i, think, I and that's what i hear when i hear that and, and and but i'm not sure that's exactly where he's going with it um and, and for some reason what popped in my mind then was uh, i just finished reading line witch in the wardrobe to scotty and in the part where edmund is taken by by the ice queen uh and she gives him turkish delights and then his heart like 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 yearns for this even like because they're even special but i think there's something truth to that that like the tangible things that feed on our greeds and our on our certain those things that aren't what's going to give us life eternal like we have to like be like made aware of those things so that we can like redirect Right. I think that is a. I think that bears witness to our comfort. That that's like where you go, because during a time of persecution, the biggest threats are not material desires, right? But lack of lack of commitment, lack of right, and so the the heresies and the things that rise up or the challenges that are, are faced during times of persecution are not necessarily related. It's not, it's not like people are being tempted away, right? Every, every martyr story we have, right? No one, no one's falling for the material things that the Romans are throwing at them, right? Like no one's Mm -hmm. actually succumbing to that real temptation if anything, you know, it's when we do hear about people who don't, uh, who, who lose their faith in, in their pursuit of martyrdom or whatnot, it's, it's, it's fear of the act. It's fear. Right? Yeah. More so mm-hmm. than, more so than I, I don't, I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sure I could check if I check the corporate, yeah, but yeah. I don't, I, there doesn't seem to be yeah. in times of persecution, in times of quote unquote stability that's when the luxuries of this life then become an object of temptation but when the choice is between 
death, physical death and physical life, the material stuff in between doesn't matter as much. I can think of an, a counter example, but I think then it's just please, doesn't really, please do. it doesn't matter. It's, it's the 40 martyrs of Sabasi, right? They built fighters yeah. and they told them to come out because it'd be more, you know, obviously not just fear of death, but yeah, but we're talking, so, but that's like, that's not like, no, a you're right. Thing. I know. I knew I was going to get a. Yeah. yeah. It, it wasn't. It wasn't Turkish on delight on the on the. Uh, on no, the it wasn't. Like, yeah, right, it wasn't. Right, right, it was. Right. It was saving your flesh, right. which he ended up right. scalding anyway, and yeah. scalding, mm-hmm. scalding. Um, uh, yes, yeah, scalding. Um, yes. Interesting. Okay. No, that that that. I th- I think you're shedding some real light on mm-hmm. on what he's what's yeah. going on here. But right. but but I think I think that that's that's important, right? Because like so, the same passage can be read in different contexts depending on our situation. Like we're not in a time of persecution; we're more in a time of comfort. Look at the difference between this and the Corinthians. At the time that Paul is Saint Paul is writing First Corinthians, they're not undergoing any persecution. Obviously, the persecutions of the Romans would expand and reach all all levels of the empire. So we know that that church does, in fact. Mm-hmm. Um, go through a period of persecution as well but all the problems they're having are all sensual related right they're all they're all it's it's money it's food right like what food we're going to eat at the at the agape meal like that becomes an issue um their sexual immorality becomes becomes an issue right Mm -hmm. and to go back to the these these particular hierarchs who are being you know remembered this day saint john chrysostom can spend the majority of his sermons pretty much telling everybody like essentially here's a little bit of theology. Oh, by the way, feed the poor, stop, you know, wearing the most, I I don't remember what passage it was, but he spent three pages on sandals on the luxuriousness of everyone's sandals and how ridiculous it was and how much, like how many people who could be fed because, and this was like a normal thing for him. Right. But he was in a period of relative stability within, mm-hmm. quote unquote, within the life of the church and the empire. Right, there was not persecution of the church; it was persecution of him, yeah, because um, he, <laughs> yeah. you know, spoke the truth. Um, but Gregory doesn't have as much of that because Gregory's fighting to protect the the truth. Gregory has mm-hmm. to fight back the Arians. So yes, there are times, especially as Christmas homily talks about, you know, not. Right you know, not falling into, right. We think, we think this conversation about how to properly celebrate Christmas is something that's like new to us. We start talking about wreaths and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 He literally talks about putting wreaths on your door and like, right. Um, and he says, it's a bad thing, by the way, like, Mm -hmm. like a, like a Puritan. Uh, (laughs) but the point being it's there, but it's not the majority of what he's dealing with. Yeah. No, in this sense, yeah. So what you're describing, and I think I'm glad I'm glad we kind of went here, although it's pulling away from what is happening here. But um, what you're describing is these two different things: you have the, the the comfortable life and how you address living in that arena, which I think is where we probably are, um, mm-hmm. and the arena of real persecution. Mm-hmm. And here, Saint Paul is talking to the Hebrews who are under real persecution, and their lives are on the line. Yeah. And okay, it's. That makes some sense. But we can extrapolate some of it to all those, to that situation of comfort. And I think this is an important one. Um, when he's talking about, again, the context in which this is written for the Hebrews versus the way in which it can be applied in our life is, it, you know, it can do both. So, yes, he's writing to people that are actually suffering real physical persecution. And he's telling them, don't be afraid to go outside and offer your lives as a sacrifice for the salvation of the people in the church, right? Like be like your leaders and live according to the truth, be like Christ and offer your blood, offer yourself as a, you know, a sacrifice of praise and be murdered outside, right? Publicly, visibly, right? That's, Mm -hmm. that's the point he's getting, but he has this line here when he says, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city which is to come, is a really important perspective. And he's talking about, you know, essentially hiding within the city walls um, versus go, stepping outside the city and offering ourselves a sacrifice. Essentially not, not hiding, but being, 
because our citizenship is not of this world or right? because our citizenship is not in in this city here and now but in the city which is to come and i think that's an important thing if we want to move beyond physical persecution to and i'm going to use the same term the persecution of comfort because in if we really think about it like comfort does attack us comfort is yeah. a persecuting force like it sounds Christian talks about this in his like in, in his homily he talks about mm-hmm. like the difference between you know like that that, that it's, it's a it could be a bad thing for us it's a it's a different kind of test right yeah and we are too comfortable too wealthy etc yeah. because it begins but i think to, we also we also i mean we can think about it as like a passive test like well I, but i think it makes sense in this in this way to think about it it does attack us right comfort is not um it's not something passive that we just need to eschew it it has its own inertia mm-hmm. and so you have to fight against it um and in that sense for for those of us who live relatively comfortable lives in relatively stable cities and in, in relatively stable communities um we need to remember that last part that our citizenship we have no lasting city right like we have our our life is not actually concerned with establishing maintaining the comfort here and now as it is with building up our citizenship in the in the age to come hmm. Hmm. and whether that is fighting against physical persecution or whether that's fighting against the persecution of comfort or whether that's fighting against my own my own passions it is about yeah. building up, establishing my citizenship in the one true city, not this one. Yeah, and 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 I think you can you can see the sort of the, the cornerstone actions of the Christian life, right? Like prayer, fasting, almsgiving, mm-hmm. for example, to be just kind of like very very simple about them, mm-hmm. as all attempts to sort of push back mm-hmm. against that persecution of comfort, mm-hmm. right? Like to 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 faithfully follow a prayer rule every morning, every evening, whenever you do it, is to push back against the comfort of watching another Sleeping. show on Netflix or whatever it is, right? Yeah. To fast is to avoid the comfort of, of, of comforting yourself with the delicious rich foods that you're used to. To not alms, to not give alms is to, again, put money into your own pocket and to buy whatever you want to, right? All, all of the basic rhythms of the Christian life, like push back against the comfort that is seen as like a sign of success and actually is like the goal of contemporary culture, which creates this mm-hmm. like very interesting t- to push into your, into your, you have no, you have no city, right? Like the goal, the, the, the goals of the city in which we live, right. Are our comfort on some level, which becomes diametrically opposed to the, the, mm-hmm. the aim of the Christian life, which is, I mean, at the end of this, this passage, she says through uh, him, let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise to God as the fruit of the lips acknowledging his name. Uh, do not neglect to do good. Share what you have. These are sacrifices that are pleasing to God. These are the everyday things that you're talking about. I mean, and he says that right here at the end, that those are the sacrifices that are pleasing to God too. Yeah. Right. That does address, that does address the, you know, the persecution of comfort, mm-hmm. right? If they're not really our, city walls for you to go out and like you still offer sacrifice of sharing what you have, doing good and making yourself less comfortable. Right. Right. But not for the sake of discomfort. Like for discomfort's sake. Oh, look at me. I'm such a martyr. I'm giving, you know, that that's a, that's not that's a negative effect of of sacrifice i think and it becomes a self-serving sacrifice um a joyful well, I mean, christ, sacrifice christ is, says that you when you do that so that other people see it you have your own reward right that but even if you, is, you is actually right but even if you don't do it for other people to see you just want them you know like there there are there is that level of like well you're doing it for yourself to see potentially right? yes right right yeah. right. right so it's not uncomfortable being uncomfortable for the sake of being uncomfortable it is becoming uncomfortable entering into the abuses in the same way that christ did in certain ways um is again is just a matter of being in love and that's what sacrifice is 
Mm -hmm. right? Because lo love can be uncomfortable, right? I'm not going to go shoot myself in the foot, right? I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot so I'm uncomfortable so, because I love Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, but like, but it's like, not, you're going to flagellate yourself. Right. I know. Right. 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 There's, right. there's, the, there's, the goal is not pain, right? The goal, the goal is right. not pain. The goal is not, the goal is not discomfort, but like the, the goal is to push back against the self-regarding comfort, which leads us to sort of focus only on my own needs, my own belly, my own pocketbook. Right. Right. There's positive results from our discomfort. Yeah. Right. I mean, okay. cl cl like a classic example that comes to mind as we're thinking about this, like the rich man and Lazarus, right. Who, it, like literally walked by this person who was at his doorstep, right? Mm -hmm. For the sake of his own comfort, had everything he wanted on his table, you know, dressed in purple and fine linens, all that sort of stuff, constantly walks by this person who had nothing and yet mm -hmm. never gave out of his comfort because the priority was his own comfort, right? Like mm -hmm. comfort can lead to that hardness of heart where it's like, I'm not going to part with this thing because it's mine. I want this. I enjoy this as opposed to a heart that like is used to comfort, not in the sense of like exulting in pain, but, you know, you get comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, it becomes, it becomes an easier thing for us to give a, give bread out of our own mouths to those who are hungry, right. To give a, a, a food out of our own at pantries to those who are hungry, whatever it might be. Um, Cause we're not soft in that way. Like we're not, we're not guided by the passions of the flesh and the passions of the stomach. Mm -hmm. right. And that's a kind of martyrdom. Right. I mean, that, that, that is a kind of martyrdom to sort of put, put, put all of those desires to death, to say no to those things again and again and again, especially like in a society as ours, where you can push a button at any time of the day and have anything you want. Right. I mean, it is, it's not to the same level, but it's a kind of self-denial. It's a kind of, again, contextual martyrdom, right. Maybe. The... Hmm. Anything cool. else we you had in mind about this epistle? Um, not with six minutes left. No, it's the lightning it's round. Just... just say things that we're not going to fully explore. Water, water. We didn't even make that joke this year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We we were so committed to not addressing water that we stopped making the joke. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about citizenship in this city and that and the city to come i don't want to open a door but like we should, we should be very clear that our citizenship primarily is in the city to come so nationalism is out he takes a sip <laughs> <laughs> Like that, it's like that Kermit. It's like that Kermit meme. Yeah, don't ask just, me. just sit my tea. That's, mm. that's none of my business. <laughs> right. Well, that's that's uh, that's a good point there. I, I, there's a recurring theme in the Bible that nationalism is out. No, I'm, well, in, in the New Testament. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, but there are also plenty of people who look at it and see many many passages to justify their own nationalism. Yeah. But think, think about, think about, I mean, just, you know, we do have, we do have four minutes left. Like think about the tension of that, right? We're talking about a, a lack of acquisitiveness. We're talking about a lack of self-regard. I mean, like something like that, that instinct to nationalism or tribalism or whatever has is it takes like that center of selfishness and it just kind of expands it a little bit. Right? Yeah. Fine, it includes other people in your selfishness. Yeah. I'm not going to be selfish as an individual. I'm just going to be selfish as like a group. I mean, it's the but... same thing. But it has to be, but it has to be my nationalism. So you have to be within my within my circle of uh, of selfishness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The point is, we need to be very clear that, like, for here we have no lasting city. Right. This is the the. We cannot use the gospel to try and establish. We cannot. It is not in our right or possibility yeah. to use the gospel to establish the kingdom of God here on earth. He will himself do that at the appropriate mm -hmm. time, but it will not be a particular nation. In fact, it will be just one city. This, the scriptures are very clear. Paradise is a city, which is a whole separate thing. Like 
you know, Christianity, in fact, is an urban religion. Yeah. That's a whole other can of worms. That's a whole, I mean, that's, that was the, this is where I went. This is like the progression that my mind went as I was prepping for this. It's like Christianity, in fact, is an urban religion. It's not, Mm. that's not how we think about it today. Yeah. Where did the cities, suburbanites go? Where do the suburbanites go? Everybody comes in. Yeah. With minivans? Just, just traffic. It's, it's hard. It's hard to be street parking for everyone. It's hard. (laughs) <laughs> so, well, it's it's hard to be an individual in the city, right? It's 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 far easier to be an individual off by yourself in the wilderness where there is nobody else where your interests sort of bump up against, right? This like spirit of sort of sacrificial other giving, like mm. kind of happens when you're surrounded by other people, right? I think that's yeah. like there's something to that kind of communal space, like the city as a as an image of the kingdom, right. rather than I see nobody for miles around. Um. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, we're, we're, we're glancing at these things in, in passing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the thing that I want to say before, before we get into that, just in terms of even like that, that, that the, 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 the nationalism, like the, the cultural sort of thing, I don't know. I think it, it's, it's potentially worth saying out loud. I think this is one of our interesting sort of contemporary challenges as, as, as Orthodox Christians in this moment, because I think we have a, a backwards looking sense of like, the Greek Orthodoxy, the Russian Orthodoxy, the sort of old country preface before our Orthodoxy and how bad that is. I think one of our temptations is just to sort of replace X Orthodoxy with American Orthodoxy and just kind of a new culturally constrained sort of whatever to which we can give more priority than the gospel and Christianity. Um, you know, the, I, mean, I'll the, go, I'll, I don't know. I don't know if ancient faith wants to disavow me as i speak i don't know i give them the ability to censor this i'm just gonna go on my own personal father paniotti rant but like not only is christianity an urban like the church is city city focused Mm -hmm. it's not regional focused it's not even country focused yeah The, the reality is the experience of the church is city focused which there is a hierarchy in the city before yeah there is the hierarchy in the city with all of the Orthodox Christians in that community, with all the practicing Christians in that community, that comprises the fullness of the church. They don't need to be like, they're not less than an archdiocese. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the role of an archdiocese, the role of a synod, the role of a patriarch is in fact to communicate between the cities or to preside at synods where the cities need to speak to one another, but that's done through the hierarchs, right? Like they in and of themselves represent their, their church, their full church. Yes. Because the, the fullness of the church is around the Eucharistic table. Yes. The bishops and this is the, this is the reason yeah. why titular bishops or bishops without an actual see with people that they represent don't actually get a vote in synods because they don't rep- because they don't represent anyone. Yeah. They don't actually represent a functioning church. Mm-hmm. It's like an unhypostasized essence, right? It's like a bare, which, a bare is then, thing. which doesn't exist. There's yeah. no such thing as unhypostasized essence. Yeah. Yeah. We've discussed yeah. this. We have. No, these are these are these are good axes to grind. Yes. These are these are very these are very, I think very interesting examples of the the ecclesiology that we profess does not necessarily match up with the ecclesiology that we live for a variety right. of historical factors right. over the last like twelve centuries. Right, and to your point about, and I'm just going to continue, and like we'll wrap up with this, right? But that that idea of there's a there's a push to you know for unity across or orthodoxy within the United States. I'm just going to be like completely honest. I don't care about that. I care about all of the Orthodox Christians locally around one bishop. Mm-hmm. That's that to me is the the essence of the church. It doesn't matter if one jurisdiction receives, you know, autonomy or autocephaly, and you know, there's more, like I honestly don't care about any of that. What I care about is like the church functions as a city because that's what it is because. Yeah. In the scriptures itself, 
here in Hebrews, but also as St. John receives the revelation of the heavenly kingdom, New Jerusalem is a city. And he goes out of his way again and again and again to describe eternal, eternal life as dwelling in a city with God. And if the yeah. church is the body of Christ, right, if the church is a foretaste of the kingdom, then structuring the church around a nationality or structuring the church around a region even undercuts the reality of what the church is here symbolizing. Cause I'm multiple right. cities up there in there where, you know, sorry, this One. is my, this is my ax. <laughs> oh, you, you can split a hair on that ax. You have, you have ground it down to a razor's edge. I haven't edge. started. <laughs> well, I'm going to stop you right there then. Please do. <laughs> please do i know what i'm doing all I right i know i know no one wants to listen to me anymore uh i enjoy <laughs> no one denies it either no i well yeah father nick's no, like okay. yeah no cool no, i, I am I, gonna i'm gonna stop now okay okay In the name of the father the son and the holy spirit now and forever and to the ages of ages amen christ amen. our god amen. we thank you for bringing us together for this podcast once again guide the course of our lives, that these teachings and your scriptures help us grow closer to you, to each other, and to the glory of your name, now and forever, to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. What axes will we grind next week? That was like, to... I've never been, you know, like how they, they play someone off in the Oscars? I've never been prayed <laughs> off before. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, the, the Sandman at the Apollo Theater comes in with like the you know the broom. Yeah. Somebody just comes on doing their cross. Or just a, just a hook. Off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sensor. Okay, let's send this into uh, 